Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks um, for that introduction. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, uh, show okay on that. Uh, thanks for the invitation to come speak here. Uh, Abusheni Dumelang. Um, this is, okay, the, the part to this keynote was one submitting an abstract, and the abstract was done uh, with Masibidi Rueda, who was just here, <laughs> uh, from Zarila, and then Jade, who's a longtime collaborator and now a co founder with us at, at Lilapa um, there at, at, in, in Joburg. Um, I think what's important for today's talk is, yes, I wear many, many, many hats. Uh, that it is, an, on one, a curse and a blessing that you have as a young person on the African continent that we have to fill in many, many of these um, different spaces so that we can move, uh, move things uh, forward. I'm originally from Harangua. Uh, I spent time in machine learning and AI uh, since about 2006 working in different spaces, but from 2015 started working really earnestly on language um, on there. But uh, through that, and then through this presentation, uh, some of this journey will become clear, and I really want us to uh, get to a point of joint understanding. Uh, that is our lab at the University of Pretoria. That's called the Data Science for Social Impact Lab. 70% of the members work on artificial intelligence and language, mostly African languages, and the other 30% work on data science and society. Right. So how, how do we actually get these tools to be used by people who are not us? Uh, and all the things that, that come with that. So we've got everything from people who are research assistants, honors, masters, PhD students, postdocs, who are within, um, with, within the team and also staff members um, on there. Uh, thanks for all the people who responded on the a survey, the pre-survey we put out. Um, just for interest, uh, your knowledge of natural language processing. I know it's a different word sometimes. Sometimes you hear HLT or human language technologies. Uh, but the national language processing is the way that we look at it a lot from computing. So I just put up that, like, you know, that question, and um, we had a lot of beginners and uh, people asking also, what is natural language uh, uh, processing? And also, in, in, I'm sorry, intermediates. Um, do you use artificial intelligence in your research? And the answer there being very interesting, half of the people do. There was a lot of, I think, comments <laughs> Uh, about also doing things like editing in English, um, uh, those things which are very interesting, and some are also then thinking about how to use these. Um, on the right there is just a, a word cloud of some of the common comments inside there. So we're trying to look at technology, digitalization, um, how we then can promote and develop our languages. Um, on there. So uh, this is obviously is a keynote, um, and it gives me that opportunity to give an opinion or us to give an opinion. So this is a very opinionated view, and but I hope that, like, you know, uh, we hope it, it, it will really encourage discussion in ways that we can think about going forward, right? Uh, so first is to think about the state of languages in, in South Africa. I know there's a South and African conference, but I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to just root it here, um, is that we have these very big parts of, hey, let's encourage the use of, um, of um, bilingualism, uh, multilingualism in everything, like you know, in our uh, in our education systems, especially for mother tongue education. While we say this, or it's encouraged, um, South Africa mostly is slowly moving towards a monolingual uh, kind of space, and it's something that we have to. And and why, or like you know, you ask yourself why um, is that happening? And some is just the ease of of things. If you don't really have tools, resources that you can use without thinking, then um, your thing. Uh, a question I tend to ask, how many in this room have a digital dictionary for their language? Whether it's on your phone or it's on your computer. Yeah. <laughs> We're in 2023. Right? If that's not available, why even do the rest? Right. If you don't have a dictionary <laughs> digitally, whether it's on your phone or it's on a computer, uh, there's only one hand that went up in the room. All right, um, kind of on there. So one way to think about this is thinking from the previous presentation, we did not script that, um, is Wikipedia. So this is a heuristic, meaning it's just that it's not a scientific thing. It's just something that we use to understand the state on the, on, on the, on the ground. Wikipedia, let's count how many articles are written in 
each of the languages, the South African languages. Uh, for, you'll see on there, for English, it's got six million plus articles that are written on Wikipedia that are in English. Africans, 110,000. We already go down by, we call a mag, uh, <laughs> an order of magnitude. We go from millions to hundreds of thousands. Isi Zulu, 10,000, 11,000. Another order of magnitude uh, drop. Then uh, Northern Sotho, or Sotho Salibua, and then it just goes down to there until you get to Isindebele, which is my wife's language. <laughs> no, no, you can't go today and say Isindebele Wikipedia. Right, and that's why that project that they're saying is, is, is there. But look then at the, and so 98% of the resources that are available now to our children, if they go online and say, I'm trying to get information, and now they'll find Wikipedia as the first source. They can never change really to our languages on there. Then when you look at the 2018 general household survey from Stats SA, you will see when it up uh, from, uh, what is this thing, Isizulu, uh, uh, Northern Sotho and Isikosa, in terms of who are speaking at home in languages. That's half the country. And how many resources do they have there? If you count them, they add up to 0.2% of Wikipedia being available to them. Right, 50% of the country. <laughs> have 0.2% resources. That's, that, that is the, that's what I'm saying, like that's a way that we can clearly look at these things. Right, so it's almost like you're looking through a, like you look at the world through a hole, and that hole is that 0.2 percent um, on there, right? So we tend to then think about this of like now we have to think about low resource languages in, in our side in computing, so uh, they have low availability of resources, the data tools. And when people say tools or these tools are available, they must be findable. There's these fair principles, accessible, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, interoperable, and reproducible. So people just saying, I have the tools are available. For me, I never believe them. Until I can go and find the thing that you've described to me, it doesn't exist. And we find this a lot with a lot of researchers um, on, on this part, and it's a way for us to look inwards. I did a project, I finished it, I come to these gatherings and say these resources are available, but nobody will ever find them. Right? And for many, many reasons. Some might be just, you can't, you can't find a place where you can host these things. Satellite is, is just one example. It's not the only one, there's many. And then some are because people don't want people to actually have easy access because I want to publish for the next 10 years in the same area without other people being able to use the same material that I have. And that's a more sinister reason. So just imagine we're almost holding our own languages hostage for such reasons. Right? Uh, discoverability, reproducibility, focus. People then tend to not focus on our languages because they don't have access to these things. Or it's easier to publish in the very global, um, these languages that are majority. There's benchmarks. And then the scale and complexity if you want to resolve these issues. Right? There's a very nice paper um, um, here on the state of um, linguistic diversity in our world, in the natural language processing world. And they show, like, you know, they, 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 they categorize each language in there. So going from a class zero, which there's like, you know, nothing, it's left, you're left behind, all the way to the winners, who are your English, your Spanish, your, uh, your French, your Japanese, um, on there. And it's a very good tool to understand where your languages are, and they give indications of really what some of the work that has to be done on there. And it's very like, bad in a lot of things, because when you think then about especially corpora that are available, it tends to match very well on there. So it's very hard to get corpora for many, many, many languages. The majority of the language getting corpora is almost impossible. And it ends up that the reason your chat GPT, your Google Bards will speak English very well is because of the availability of corpora. Uh, when it comes to that. But maybe, you, like, you know, I'm skipping on, on the part. Let's get to that joint understanding part. I'll explain a bit of what AI is, what natural language processing is, and then we'll take on, like, you know, this part of the journey. So one, what's artificial intelligence? You hear it a lot. Uh, first, a classical definition. It's an agent. I mean, it's a machine. It exists in the envi some environment. It takes action to achieve some goal. So here is one of my daughters. She's looking at our robot vacuum cleaner in the house. 
That vacuum cleaner is an agent. It exists in the house. The action that it can take is that it can move around, it can vacuum, and the goal is to try and uh, keep the house clean. That's an artificial intelligence. A search engine is an artificial intelligence. It's online, it's on the internet. You type in something into it. The action that it takes is it looks at its databases and searches for content. It returns content to you, hopefully, that is relevant to your query, what you typed in, right? That's the goal of the thing. So a search engine is an artificial intelligence. The other word you hear is machine learning. So what's machine learning? Machine learning is a subset of AI that specifically deals with learning patterns from data. And this is very instructive in our world because a lot of the work that is being done in languages is understanding these patterns, right? Because we're trying to learn about the language. What is actually the rules? All those things are the patterns that are inside there. So in machine learning, let's say for example, I give you two points on a plane. So it's a flat surface and I give you two points and I tell you that the color of one point is red and then the other one is blue. I then say, can you predict if I drop a dot that, is color, that doesn't have a color, can you predict what color it's supposed to be? So what you have to do is you have to learn this thing called the decision boundary or function. So in this one, if I only gave you two points, two examples, the easiest thing to learn is a straight line that sits equidistant between the two points. And you say, anything that's on the left of that line in the future, I will say, I'll predict is red, and anything that's on the right of that line, I'll predict that it's blue. Life is not that simple. So if our data becomes more complicated, what then happens is that our decision function or our decision boundary also changes and becomes more complex as well. Right, so now you can see that the decision function is no longer a straight line, but it's something that's a quadratic function on there um, that goes there. So this is called supervised learning because you're giving both the, what's the input, where the dot is, and then the color, which is supposed to be the output, right? What the, what, um, um, what the thing that you're supposed to predict actually is. And you can really make the jump to today, you take your phone, you take pictures, and later on you can ask your, your phone, type in trees, and it shows you all these pictures of trees. What happened? People have been training machine learning algorithms that are given lots of examples of pictures, and they tag what are inside those pictures. And then you learn the pattern. Over time, the machine learns that, okay, if an image looks like this, there's a tree, right? And in the same way, that's why you can identify that in this picture, there's actually a dog and not a cat, right? And then the decision boundaries are being trained using these deep learning or deep neural networks that are much bigger um, on, on that one. Why do we do this in machine learning? In the past, you would have to write up all these rules of what you're supposed to be seeing. A simple example for the people in the room is thinking about machine, a rule-based machine translation in the past. Right? In the early days of machine translations in, in computing, is you would have to figure out the rules in English, the rules in French, and then say, how do you then do, if you've got a sentence um, in English, how would you then change it? What are all the rules that have to be followed so that you can change that sentence into French? So it was, you would write down all the rules. With machine learning, all you have to do is give as many examples of translations as possible. The machine will learn those patterns themselves. You don't need to know the rules. Right. This is the big debate inside natural language processing, right? About uh, Noam Chomsky versus the machine learning people of saying, no, we must come up with the grammar, understand the linguistics of a language so that we can model it. Right. That was, uh, I think, 80s, 70s. And then now you come to 2023. That's almost completely gone when it comes to technology. It's data, data, data. Right, saying that we don't necessarily need to understand any of these things about grammatical rules and all those things to have useful tools. People use Google Translate, they don't ask about the grammar. They just use it. Why? Data-driven machine learning. Right, so, so there's a part of there of saying that something is going on here and we must understand it. Right? Uh, in natural language processing, as I say, uh, breakthroughs, you research engines, you've got virtual assistants, you can talk to your phone, uh, spam filters, which is probably likely the first natural language processing tool you used was your spam folder on your email that it, it, it took that, translation chatbots. And all of these now are driven mostly machine learning. Uh, there was a time where uh, things like translation was, was rule-based, but then that it couldn't scale as much as what's actually going on in the machine learning side. So everything is now driven into, um, uh, from a data, uh, a data side. So 
when thinking about natural language processing, we think of tasks of what is your input, output, greetings elders, your translation, um, sentiment analysis was one of the worst days of the year, the output being negative, the thing you would predict, who is the president of South Africa? It responding and saying Cyril Ramaphosa. So these systems that you're seeing now, these uh, pre-trained transformer chatbot systems, uh, like ChatGPT, Bard, are trained a lot from giving a lot of examples of questions and answers, and then they learn the patterns. So that even if questions come that they've never seen before, they now can generate answers. Right? Um, spam uh, summarization, for example, is a very big task now uh, that people are trying to do. We're trying to do, for example, things like entailment in Sotswana. And yes, this is not the first time we're going through this. It's just that there's specific things that have happened, especially computing becoming very cheap, uh, data storage becoming very cheap. And we're now in this area of generative AI, where you have all these tools that generate many, many different things on there. So we need to learn from the past to get a grip on the future. There will be many, many ideas that are floating around. Most of them will wither away. So yes, every few hours, somebody is going to be saying, here's the great thing about AI that you should all do and all those things. But most of these will go away. A, a good way to see this is the publication of machine learning papers or AI papers. So right now, uh, uh, on Archive, so Archive is this place where you put preprint papers. The way you're supposed to do it is you submit to a conference, and then at that conference they accept you, and then you upload it onto preprint before it gets published in the main conference or the main journal. But people also now are just doing it because it's a faster way to get your ideas out there. In, in, in some ways. So there's, there's lots of debates in the scientific community about is that correct, is the correct way. But now that red line there is an estimation or is a um, summarization of how many papers are published on archive every month. We are now at 4,000. More than 100 AI papers a day are made available. Right? I, I actually end up using Twitter now as my place to find papers because I follow specific people. When they release a preprint, I put it on my reading list. I print them. I've got a few papers in my, in my bag. Every time I have a time, some time off or I'm waiting for something, I put it out and I start reading because that's how, how it is. So every day, like while we've, I've been talking, <laughs> right now there's probably three or four, five new papers on archive that have shown up in my area. So something is happening. You can't ignore it. And there. Think to understand here, the people in the room. Machines do not understand language. You do. They can process it, they can learn patterns, but they do not understand language. There's many opportunities in this area to collaborate. This is almost like the, the thing I'm going to give at the end, but I wanted to give it here. What can we learn from these models about our languages and ourselves? And one can those models also learn from your experiences, right? And then how do we then make these also fit for purpose? ChatGPT is not good for you if you're outside English and, and German and things like that. But people are trying to use it for this. And it's going to lead to really, really bad <laughs> parts and things like that. Because people think, no, no, now I've seen the machine. It does very well in English. It should do well in the other languages. It does not. And for them to get to a point where they work very well for us, it means we have to stand up and say we want to be counted. It is not going to happen automatically just because. So just some examples from our lab uh, on, on doing like what kind of things are we doing in this area. Uh, okay, not just from our lab, but from Asakani and some friends beyond. Uh, this is one project. Um, as I said, uh, we are very big in our lab is identifying data and making it available, building models. So this one was preparing the Vubizenzele and South African government multilingual data set. So what we did here, lots of data research, I mean, uh, language resource data or corpora are not easily available, but there is data. It's there. Government creates it all the time. Why are we not having it easily accessible? Metadata is bad. Again, Isindebele has very few resources. And you have work like Achumato in the past at NCHLT that have worked on there, but then due to also the way that they, their projects are structured, they don't really tell you exactly what each piece of content comes from. And it's very important for us who come from a computation space because I need to understand the context of where the, where, where the content comes from because when I build models, I need to be, able to, un to be able to bias towards one thing or another. So what was the project trying to do? You want to liberate that's an instructive word, liberate, 
and prepare external multilingual data from government um, uh, communication and information systems, GCIS. You want to extract aligned sentence pairs, I'll show you all now. Automate as much of this process and then create benchmarks, especially for machine translation. And then we release this data publicly for anybody to use. What we did, at first, government, uh, the cabinet speeches are translated into all 11 languages. So after a cabinet uh, statement is put out, normally a week or two later, they also put out all the translations. So what we wanted to do, these are in HTML on the website. If you have to go every, every, every two weeks, I mean, every, every time they think and go and copy and paste, it's a problem. But we can just create a CSV file or a JSON file that you can download. And what it does, it will have inside the date, the date time, the title, and then inside there's a language payload, meaning every translation of that speech is available to you. You can download it, you have that file on your computer. It has all the speeches up to the date that you download it. And what we say about automation, this system runs every Friday, checks the government website. If there's a new speech, it automatically processes it and puts it there and it's available. We don't even do anymore. We worked on it, 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 it runs on that. Second one, Bugu Zanzele. Bugu Zanzele is a government uh, thing. How many people know about Bugu Zanzele in this room? Uh, okay, you just signed an MOU with GCIS, so that's very bad. I think it's five people. Bugu Zanzele is a government newspaper published twice a month. If there's 20 English articles in an edition, so one, or is it two editions a month, 20 articles, only two or three of them are translated into the rest of the South African languages. What did I say about that thing that you're looking through with the world <laughs> on there? Government is really literally making that choice that only 10% of the content in this newspaper gets translated to the rest of the languages. So if you are a South African citizen who does not really interact in the world in English, you only see 10% of what the government is doing. Right, that's what they're telling you, <laughs> kind of on there. So they put this out in PDF. PDF is really bad for computation. We asked them, can we please get access to this in the files after they've been translated? They unfortunately refused. And what we did last year, we spent the year, hired people in the lab, and then we went extracting each of the manually from each of these PDFs. And what we created now is a simple TXT file. It's very simple. First line has the t title of the article in the language, an empty line, the author, So, because we have to say who wrote that thing, um, another line, and then the body of the text. All the ones that are translated we extracted all of these, and then now you know this article in Chivenda is the same as this article in Isitkos. Kind of on there, and guess what? Uh, and then the thing that you can do is you can also go and extract the sentences in each article, and there's ways to computational to identify if one sentence in, 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 um, in Chivenda is the same sentence in Isitkos, and we built that. What does that allow now? We now have, for example, on the table on the right, 3,500 parallel sentences between Isindebele to English that we just did just because we did that work. And if you've got that, we also have all other 54 directions. You can do Siswati to Chivenda. You can do all the ones we've built them. 55 different directions, you have all these sentence pairs. And remember the machine learning, how does it learn? You give it examples and then it learns to do the thing. So what can you do if you've got this? You can now actually train machine translation systems given that you've got all these sentence pairs, and that's what we did. So here are some examples of us doing to English, like Saswati and Sindavele to English translations. Uh, Achumato, which I talked about from um, uh, some of the Sadila things, they had already done that, but we're, for some things like uh, Siswati, Northern, um, Northern Sotu, they didn't have, and now we actually have those models that are available for those translations. And we are, about to, um, we are working over the next six weeks to now release the other directions. So the whole thing of having English as the pivot language, we're going to remove. You will be able to get Saswati to Chivenda, Chivenda to Sikosa, all those translation systems actually being available. They're not going to be perfect, but they have to be there for us to move forward. You can't skip it. You have to do the work, right? For example, this is um, SABC Tinzava, the Saswati um, uh, one. So uh, just because I can't do live things, so this is the model. Uh, I'll lose, uh, I'm uh, making fun of Muzi up here in the front because he's playing, playing around with it for us and telling us how bad it is. He's a linguist. <laughs> how bad it is. If every time we, we send him a message saying we've, we've improved it, can you please tell us how bad it is? And then he tells us again and then we go and work on them. Um, and there it is. We take the, the text that comes from uh, the SABC Twitter 
and then you paste it in there, and then you can see there's the English translation, uh, uh, for example, um, that's on there. Not perfect, but it's a beginning. All right, and then again, those models are open, they're freely available, anybody can use them. Second one is Pua Beta. My mother's language is Setswana. Um, so we wanted to work on Setswana. There's a project that took us three years, but now I think we can do it in less than six months. We have to learn <laughs> on there. Um, and this is, was the training of a, a curated language model for Setswana. So language models are these things that are precursors to your chat GPTs. You must have language models before you've got a chat GPT. So the first thing you have to do is get corpora. For English, for chat GPT, it's terabytes to petabytes of data that's in English that is used on there. We spent three years uh, coming together with this mixed corpora or, uh, called uh, poor data. And you can see poor data there. You can see all the different uh, things that it has inside, NCNGLT, Nalibali, the Bible, the Constitution, Leipzig, um, SABC, Dikang, their Facebook, Mutsuiding FM, um, the Wikipedia, Vuguzenzele, which now we had already done the work. So now we have that available to ourselves, Department of Basic Education. You get to, on that data, on your disk, if you have to download it, it's 25 megabytes. Right, what did I say about English? Terabytes, petabytes. Right, so a terabyte, a thousand gigabytes. All right, and then we've got 4 million, 4.5 million words. Then there's poor data plus JW300. JW300 was a data set that was created, especially parallel, by using Jehovah's Witnesses publications. So the Jehovah's Witnesses are prolific translators. So what happened is that researchers from computing then said, no, if they're doing, why don't we take their publications and then extract them and make them machine read, uh, available for people to use, especially in translation. And in 2021, the Jehovah's Witnesses organization came and said, no, no more. You can't use our content anymore. So I already, this project started in 2020, so we had it. So you also have poor data plus JW300. One thing you will note it about JW300 Setswana, I said there's 4.5 million words, tokens, inside the poor data without JW300. JW300, just by itself, just the things that come from the Jehovah's Witnesses, almost 20 million, four times as much. Right? But it's religiously biased. It won't tell you a lot of things about things, especially outside religion, but it's biased on there. So now if you add those, you get to 25 million if you add the two. And then there's also NCHLT that is coming uh, from uh, um, CTEX and Sadila. Uh, they said they had 14 million tokens in their model that I'll show on there. What can you do? We build, now we can build this thing. Oh, I forgot to click. Okay. Um, this thing called a mass uh, language model. So these models, what they're doing is just, you train them to predict if, if it, the word, you remove a word and you ask it to predict the word that's missing in a sentence. So before ChatGPT, everybody trains a model like this using this data. The reason that you do that, it's very easy to do the whole input output examples thing. You just take your corpus, you, you take a sentence, you randomly remove a word, and then you say, here's your input, here's your output. Then the machine learns to predict What's the word? And if it does that, it's almost learning grammar. Because it gets to understand the structure of the sentence, all those things to say, what is the word that is missing on the sentence? So to do, that's how then poor Bertha comes in. This is the same model, but for Setswana. And we trained it, it took three days each, one with only the poor data, and then poor data plus JW300. What can you do once you have this model? You can then fine tune it. So do training one more time towards your final applications. So one, Masakani NER, named entity recognition, right? Afro, Afri Berta, Afro XMLR are multilingual models. They have lots of African languages inside it. And their performance, here higher is better. We can see they get up to 89.4 if you use those models and then you do NER for Setswana. The monolingual models, there's the NCHLT one, 74.2. There's Pua Berta without JW3N, 78.2. And then poor Berta plus JW300, we get 80.2. Parts of speech tagging. Um, the multilingual models um, get up to 83.8. Afro-LM is built by one of our uh, team members and employees at Lilapa. AI gets up to 83.8. But actually, poor Berta and plus JW300 gets to 84.1. So that 25 megabyte model can be very, very large models. 
right? That this shows us that our, our work matters. You don't give up just because you're saying, I'm looking at giants and these people are building all these other things that we shouldn't be doing the work. We have to do the work because you can't beat them. And why? We care about our languages. We will take time and then we will build things that are actually fit for purpose. Um, on there. Then, um, again, why this was a three-year plus project. We went to the daily news website from the Botswana government. They have a Botswana section called the Kang. And we downloaded data from their 5,000 articles a long time ago. Then we got some annotators, so people to help us actually mark these uh, things. So we used uh, the IPTC codes in terms of categorizing each news article into one of these codes. Right? So it is what categorizing the news. Um, so this was uh, especially like thanks to uh, Dolly Wagner at, at, at Sol Salt Lucky. Um, we worked on that. So on the left is just the, what the category is in English, and then also we've translated it into Setswana. And then on the right is just the visualization of those news articles as colors. So each category given the data set. So, and then this is the distribution. Most of the articles actually end up being categorized as Setswana. You can see then some of the, so as, uh, as society, and then there's the other ones. Now we want to build a model that is, could be useful, especially for adding metadata to Setswana news content automatically. And if you do that, what we find, uh, sorry, at the bottom there where I am, you can remove me there for just a little bit. Can you remove me from the bottom right? Oh, just show the slides without, okay. Yeah, at the bottom there, what you see is poor beta. The, again, higher is better there. We're trying to get to 100% accuracy, but we're getting to 65, 66, 65. Uh, percent uh, prediction accuracy on there. And one of the things we can see, um, sorry. Some of these categories, they get mixed up, meaning that the machine can't really tease them apart, right? It could be health and, and society, very similar in some ways. Politics and society, very similar in some ways. Um, oh no, thanks, yeah, top right is much better. <laughs> Um, uh, kind, kind of on there. But we have a model, and the model is doing very, very well um, uh, with, within there. And, and this is the paper itself is under review. The poor Berta, before it's trained to do the NER, the POS, and the news categorization, um, is available. It's been early access. People can go and then use it and apply it to other, other things. Uh, once we get the reviews from this paper, we will then release all the models. So you will be able to get, for example, this is the NER model. Uh, you just type in the, the, the sentence there. Um, Zimbabwe, tags that Lefazila Zimbabwe is a location. So this model will be available and you can use it online. You don't need to know any computing or anything like that. Uh, on there, and then you'll see it says Labone, tags the date. And then you see some of the other ones have mistakes. As I said, that's where we come in. You know a lot more than these, these in the machine. How then do we then say, oh, where, how does it fail? Why is it failing? What are these areas? How then do we then cre either create new corpora or provide new examples that we can actually improve these things? Oh, we can do part of speech. Right, same, the same sentence and we put it through there. Again, I know it will have error. You can throw rotten tomatoes at me, that's okay. It means we're doing something right. right. Once we at least have something to argue about, at least it's there. <laughs> Right? And it's open. As I said, for us, what we do, default, open, and available. There is no, please first come to my office and I'll give it to you, and you are not allowed to talk to somebody else or give it to somebody else. Our languages are dying. That should not be acceptable. Tools should be open for people to use um, on, on, on that part. Um, then another one is through the Lacuna Fund. I sit on the steering committee. We fund the creation of data sets for different uses in AI, one being language. If I remember correctly, uh, Stan B Connected, I think we've, we, we've given out $9 million in funds since 2021, and $2.5 to $2.6 million of that funding has gone to natural language processing, so language data sets. So I'm gonna talk about one part. So we just had our board meetings over the last two days. So I just finished yesterday our board meeting um, on there. And this was early 2023, we were at that, like you can see, language had 21 projects that were going on uh, to do language. So one project of this is called the Ken Corpus uh, uh, to create uh, uh, corpora and data for uh, uh, a number of languages in Kenya. 
this is the output. This output already exists. These, these teams worked last year um, for the last two years, too, on them. Do you see what they say they have created? The numbers. Um, they have 176 hours of recordings of speech. They've got 1,500 Duolu or Swahili pairs of translations, 10,900 Luya pairs. <laughs> All right. They have question and answers where somebody asks ask a question in Luo and then also they write the answer in Luo. Same thing with Swahili. They have parts of speech tech data, 1, 100, 143,000. Right. Swahili transcriptions from audio. Right. How do they do it? Massive teams. Not one university, not one team, not three people and all those things is saying these things of we have fences and walls, throw them out. We need to work right now, we build. Come up with the scientific things that need to be done, do them. Um, uh, are kind of on there. And you can see they're, good. they're doing data collection, they're building uh, the language resources, uh, finding uh, advertising ways for people to join those communities and work together and get it done. The main CAN corpus has already been downloaded. It's being available for, I think, just over a year. 333,000 times. Right. Open, not this thing again. They built it, released it. Right. Um, on there. So, in this last, I guess, 10 minutes or so, uh, revolutions are fast and slow. And sometimes you have to ask this community all you need. So, we talk about grassroots AI. What is grassroots AI? It's these ways of building kind of collaborative communities. They lower barrier to entry, multidisciplinary by nature, inclusive, they address systemic issues, collaborative, independent, holistic, and community focused. Um, I'll, I'll talk about deep learning in Daba and Masakane, but in AI itself, the community, it's, it, we've had this, um, what is the culture of having lots and lots of grassroots come up on there, but there's been an acceleration, especially since people like the deep learning in Daba and Masakane have showed up on there, and these are African ones that have actually shown, global, had global impact and shown the world that we must do this. In Masakane, uh, we uh, founded this in 2019, is to strengthen natural language processing features for African languages driven by Africans. Uh, this is the board of directors, I'm missing one person on there, Hadi, uh, from Tunisia. Uh, but you see, young people again <laughs> to lead, as, 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 as it said. And the thing with Masakane that's very interesting is that it recognizes everybody in the chain. It is not just the person at the end who does the AI. Everybody who creates the content, curates, works with communities, all those people are recognized as part of the way that we do our work. And it doesn't, you're a linguist, you're an archivist, you are a person literally who just does another job during the day and at night works on African languages. People just join. There's a weekly meeting, I think, on Tuesday afternoons that people are still on Zoom, that people are still joining. People come there, they talk about the project that they're working on. Some people say, no, I'll join you on that and work with you. Didn't need to sign any MOUs, didn't need to go ask for permission, didn't need to go, just go and work. What has that led to? First uh, uh, is the communities itself. As I said, that's Jade, uh, Guru, Ambisa, uh, uh, on the people meeting at other conferences as part of this Masakani community, because now you get to call yourself a person. You are not the African in the room. You are the African working on your languages um, on this part. We have other workshops that we created that we try to work on on there, and that you know, we've grown up other countries doing their work for PhDs and on African languages. Um, on there. And this was us in May at ICL. ICL is the premier conference in AI in the world. First time we've held it on the African continent. Um, this was then the Africa at E workshop that we met for that. And that conference took me as 3,000 people. In, 20, in 2019, before COVID, we were only about 60,000 that went. We were about 3,000. Now we had it in Rwanda. change the way that we do things. This is the first paper that we did with uh, Masakane, uh, the collaborative approach. Um, this I participated in. You can see how many, how many people are on that paper. This first won the first Wikimedia Award uh, that was used as part of the Wikimedia Project. Um, and then 
then after that, it just kept going. Goes down, goes down, goes down, goes down, goes down, goes down. Right? I can't even argue with AI. Think of AI. The thing of saying, oh, we have all these problems and that's why it starts saying, no, 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 we work on it. And then I know you won the Java Summit Award. Honorable mention for the Digital Humanities Award. The Digital Humanity Award on that one. And from here, just to say, no one is coming to save us. No one is coming to save us. We are the ones who've been here. So on the deep learning and Dharma, I'm finishing up. Uh, we then had this idea in 2016 to say Africans must become critical contributors, owners, and shapers of these coming AI revolutions. This was 2016. We were looking, a lot of us had done our PhDs, some of us had come uh, internationally and come back, and we were noting government is not doing the work, universities are not doing the work, um, private sector is not doing, of, of saying we need to raise armies of people working in these spaces. It cannot be five, 10 people, we need thousands working across the continent in AI because these things are here, they are coming, and people don't understand. So the thing we're seeing now with ChatGPT, it's like it was way expected a long time ago. So we started this in 2017. The first meeting was at VET, um, um, uh, almost like as a summer school. We had 700 application, applicants and 300 got accepted and they attended. Uh, we went to Stellenbosch the next year. Six, uh, we had 1,500 applications to come to that meeting. Now it had become a conference. 650 were accepted. Then we moved to Kenya and Nairobi. Uh, 650 attending, 1,000 applications. So keep track of those applications. Last year we were in Tunisia, 400 people because of COVID, we weren't sure. Lots and lots of applications, I think it was close to 2,000. This year, uh, th three weeks ago, we were in Accra and Ghana. We had 800 attending, 3,000 applications. Uh, meaning we can't take, it's, it's, it's a huge amount of the, I'm pretty sure 30% of those people in the picture of the attendees are working on language. So the AI community is here. <laughs> They're working and we're trying to say, how do we cross between the two places? That's why I came. I knew uh, Ru and Masividu will tell you there was literally an email that I sent. I think it's time. We can't be on the side of, no, I'm working in AI. I don't come here. Or people are working in linguistics on this side and then they go to the other meetings. You have to be going between. Uh, on the 36 African countries, 800 attendees. Also like no other conference in, in, in AI in the world, 45% of them being women. Gave 200 travel grants from anywhere across the continent to get to Ghana. Um, yeah. What also got us here won't take us there. We know that the next part is going to be very tough and we need to scale. Um, um, I've talked about the community, the impact, the rising seniority. We need to absorb the funding available. I'm telling you right now, even if you don't believe it, saying the good news, there's way more money in African AI language than we can absorb on the continent. Don't have the people to actually absorb that amount of money that's available. There's opportunities for everybody. We need to develop our faculties and lecturers so that they can focus on the work that needs to be done. Right? And we need to blaze our own path. It's not copying other people. When I talk about Masakane and deep learning in Daba, they are the leading in the world. Other people are copying us. Right? So we have to blaze our own path on there, and there must be local R&D increases. They're not gonna come from the government. Sports, arts and education, no. DSI, no. DHET, they're going through their own things at the moment. Private sector has to come in and start playing around. And to do this, then we need to build and scale together. Right? To build these strengths together, labs, institutions, across disciplines, build connections, build interconnected networks, and we should be our own ambassadors of our community. Speak freely about other people's work and how great it is. 
you're not the ambassador for our community. What's the point? Then people out there then keep on saying, well, we don't see any critical mass on that content. You're just skipped. This is the age pyramid. I'm sorry, uh, last few minutes. Age pyramid of the world. On the top left is the world with Europe. So you can see most people are around 50s, 60s. Uh, then when you go to the bottom right, that's sub-Saharan Africa. Our mo the most amount of people we have are under 10 years old. You have to think very different. You have to change things. You have to have growth in economies, growth in many things, because our population is not us. It's young, young people on there. And we need to then solve all of these challenges that we always talk about have to be solved. Every, every, everything has to be solved <laughs> everywhere, all at once. There is no, no, we must first wait for this and things like that. We must resolve everything all at once because we only have a few decades before so many languages literally become extinct. Like my, my, my student works on Swahili and she, she, tries to, she tends to say, Swahili is spoken by tens of millions of people. But at the moment, the prediction is that 30 years from now, if we do nothing, it will be dead. So let's do this, right? So in times of crisis, people build bridges, not these uh, barriers of saying, no, I'm protecting myself. I want to keep my little funding. I want to keep my little program at my universities. No, open up and let's build together. One more thing, please do welcome those, um, those pirate ships into the Atlantic. And the Quorum, all those things, protocol, no. Uh, we, um, at the, this year's Unzula meeting at, U, at UP, I, I, I put out this thing of saying, no, we want to build this African language data liberation front where we identify especially publicly funded resources that were, as were supposed to be created, whether by universities, by research groups, by professors, that are now sitting behind not being accessible. And we go out there and then try to get them. And that right, why? Because we have a right to research. And if they were publicly funded, they must be publicly available. And as such, for this week, today I'm announcing, first time, <laughs> we're releasing OERTB, which is the open, um, a resource um, education resource term bank. The sample is now available. You can go to that website um, on there, which it was funded by DHET. It was worked on by UP and, and UCT, but through different things, it ended up being inaccessible. And you will be able to get, I think, for, I think if it's not nine languages, um, I think it's a set of over 5,000 terms, all translated. And the sample is available with 5,000, I mean 50, and then over the next few weeks, we'll be making available the rest of it. We're just now doing uh, tests and, and checking and all those things. So if you have data and it's not accessible for whatever reason and you need help, get in touch. We'll make it available. And it's going to be open forever. We will die. Our children's children will die. This data will still be available um, on there. So we thank the, our collaborators. For me, at, at our lab, we work with newspapers, community newspapers, governments. It doesn't matter. Also thank our, our, our funders at our lab uh, that keep, keep us actually working on this work. And yeah, thanks again for inviting me and then I look forward to if there's any one or two questions uh, before. That.